Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, I'll be wrapping up my two-part review series on the ASR1 cockpit from the guys at Advanced Sim Racing. I already did a review on their top-tier cockpit offering, which is the ASR6. The ASR1 is their entry-level cockpit offering, coming in at $400 plus shipping. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. I'm going to mount the seat first to this ASR1 cockpit to start out our setup video. The seat is the central place for me anyway, the way I build cockpits, to determine where my motor mount's going to end up, where my pedal tray is going to end up, the shifter. Everything kind of works around where the seat is. Now, of course, I can move that seat up and back if I want to, right, to accommodate the existing settings that I have. But I prefer to get my seat set in a certain way as far as distance from the back of the cockpit. And this really applies to people if you have any kind of a motion bolted to your chassis. You may need to center your weight or get your center of gravity in the correct place. And that means you have to place the seat in a certain spot. So when you're sitting in it, the center of gravity of your whole chassis works out to be right. Anyway, I'm going to mount the seat first. Now, I'm going to use this seat here. This is a prism seat, a medium size, and it has some aluminum side mount seat brackets. Now, the reason I tell you they're aluminum is because they are thicker than the normal seat brackets that are steel. The steel ones are about two, three millimeters thick, maybe. These are a full six millimeters thick or quarter inch because they're made from aluminum. So I'm going to need longer bolts than come with this particular cockpit kit. No fault of their own. It's just what I'm going to be putting on here. And you do get a set of bolts and T-nuts with this, as you do with everything else. As far as the parts, if you saw part one of this review series, the build, then you saw that we had all these packages of bolts, and it was pretty easy to find what we needed to build things. Now, this comes with some button head bolts in it. And they're M8s. And, of course, we have some T-nuts. We have four of them. But the button head bolts actually are a good idea for clearance under the seat to try to get a hex wrench on it. But they're only 10 millimeters long, and they're meant for the regular type of side mount seat brackets or perhaps a seat slider. They're also thin metal on the side that you're bolting to the channels down here. So I have something else I'm going to be using instead of these button heads, and it's this guy. This is 15 millimeters long. It is a steel bolt with a hex head on it and a built-in flange. And it is a 12 millimeter wrench size. A couple of things here. This allows me more clearance because I can get a wrench on it, which is thinner underneath the seat. If I have a seat that's really raked back against the brackets, you might find you don't have much room in there to be able to tighten this down or loosen it. So that's what I would be doing with this head on here. And I can just use a quick wrench here 12 millimeter to take it on and off. And this has a ratcheting head on it, so it makes it even faster. So this is what we're going to be using, this and their T-nuts to mount the seat. Now, before you mount your seat, you want to get your centers lined up correctly. And I'll just measure the centers here, and I already know what they are, obviously. They are 363 millimeters to the centers of the holes that I'm going to be using. They are also 360 millimeters here. Now, on a race seat, Typically, they are more narrow in the back than they are in the front because they're shaped for the human body. So you usually have to put some spacers on the back part, and I do have spacers in here, to kick the back of your rails out so they will be straight with each other. Otherwise, they'd be tilted in, and then it, wouldn't, it would fit. You might even get it to bolt up, but if you ever try to slide it, it would just bind up. So, and if you had sliders, you would have to get it straight because it wouldn't fit right on the sliders either. So we know it's... 363 millimeters. I came over here, already did this, and moved these to where the centers were at 363 millimeters. But you also make sure that they are 363 millimeters at the front. So you check it, tap things back and forth until you get it right. Pretty simple, really, at the end of the day. But this is going to save you a lot of time trying to move things around if it doesn't line up when you first set your seat on there. So good to get your measurements right and it usually will go pretty smoothly. And I'm going to find that out now because I'm going to put my T-nuts in the channels. I'm going to bring the seat over, mount it, and when we come back, we'll see how that went. We are back with the seat properly mounted now. 
And again, I have those hex head bolts in here so that I can adjust them easily. You can see it's pretty close quarters in there. It's not so bad if you're looking straight down, though. I still have access to them. And I haven't finally torqued them down yet, so they don't have the final torque on them yet. But it's still pretty solid. I just did tighten it down a little bit. But everything lined up perfectly straight. And again, if you get your measurements right, that should be what you end up with. I'm going to go in there in front here. You can see where I have the bolts. It's a little dark. There's one bolt there. See the back one. And we have the same thing over here. All right. So now, just from sitting in the seat where it is, I can tell that my wheelbase uprights, shifter mount, everything has got to come towards me quite a bit, including the pedal tray. The pedal tray, not so much but definitely where the wheel is going to be. And I can't make the final determination on where that's going to be until I get my wheelbase mounted and the wheel attached to it, then I'll know for sure. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go ahead and hang the motor on here and get a wheel attached to it. And this is a very simple thing. I'll be using a, I believe I'm going to use a semi-cube. It's the sport model they have. It does 15 newton meters peak, so I think that'd be a good test servo motor for this rig. Now what I'm going to do is show you that it's straight up and down now, but I'm going to have to tilt that back a little bit because of the height limits of this 24 inch upright, which I don't mind doing. I still prefer it to be straight up and down and I'm still going to look at that, but I got a feeling from initial, you know, I do this a lot. So <laughs> when I sit down it looked like initially I'm going to tilt that back a bit. I don't know how much, but we'll get there when we get there. But right now we'll go ahead and Put the motor in again four bolts and they give us the four bolts for this remember this is a recessed piece or hole here it has a counter bore in there you can see the edges so that the special bolts that they give us will sit flush with the wheel mount itself which you don't have to do but if you're going to mount accessories and stuff it's nice that that happens so you can get something close and don't have to worry about hitting your bolts up here and we have some screws for these little holes here that are threaded in this mount so we can mount an accessory to it if you want to and i might show you that once i get the motor mounted so yeah very easy thing to do four bolts and we're in at least that's what i hope is going to happen <laughs> so when we get back we'll see how that went here is our direct drive wheelbase attached to the front mount and again you can see how these bolts here are sitting flush with the front of the mount they sit down in those counterboard sections and they're long enough to go all the way through the flange of this semi-cube sport wheel and I have the wheel mounted and this gives me a good idea exactly where I need this to be and I'm a fair way away <laughs> so I'm gonna have to loosen up these M8 only on the bottom though the channel so i got two over here on the bottom of these corner brackets i got two over here and the idea is also to just loosen up the one down here on the shifter bracket and then i should be able to slide the whole thing towards the seat very carefully i'm gonna get them good and loose and what i'll do is i'll get behind the wheel base here and stand on the pedal tray and just lift up on the whole thing as I slide it forward because I don't want to scratch anything up if at all possible. I want to avoid that. So that's how I'm going to do it. Just get in here behind the wheel like this. And I'll just pick up on either side of these 1530 profiles underneath. Take the weight off of it and it should scoot pretty easily I would imagine. So that's what I'm going to do. Get that sorted first before I even think about putting the pedals on because I want to get that where it needs to be and then I'll be able to move on to the pedals knowing exactly where they need to be. So when we come back, I'm going to have this thing moved and I might even sit down in the seat and show you guys how that is working for me once we get it done. I have the wheelbase upright supports moved now and the back of the shifter bracket moved pretty far back and I did lower the shifter bracket too while I was at it because I was looking at it and I couldn't help myself when I was sitting in the seat and feeling how it felt now i did have to tilt this back a bit you can see i still have some room in the slot there on the front not as much as i thought i would 
what I typically like to do is have the center of this wheel pointing at my neck just below the chin when I'm driving. And that's usually the most comfortable for me. And of course the reach, a lot of people like to do the ball of the wrist should be at the top here, but it depends. I mean, that's a good generalization as far as when you're going for comfort and the proper position you need to be in, but everybody's a little different. I mean, even our arms can be shorter or longer than each other. So even that matters. But anyway, we got it moved. Didn't do any scratching. Nice and clean. Again, by lifting up on this mount and scooting it, everything went pretty well, actually. What I'm going to do is go ahead and get in now and show you guys how this ended up. It is a little bit of a squeeze. Let's get my transmitter out of the way. I have to kind of put my feet in and climb in like that. And I'll pick this one up and get in. And if you guys have ever been in a real race car with a roll bar in it, then you are familiar with that little maneuver there. <laughs> you don't really sit in a seat. You kind of climb into it. All right. So here I am. My wrist, ball of my wrists are a little bit further. But when I bend my arms, I'm trying to get around a 90, 80 degree angle on my arms. That's usually comfortable for me. And I just know that because I've done it so much. And yeah, this is the center of the wheel is pointing right at the bottom of my chin where my neck is. And that's typically where I want it to be. So when I'm turning the wheel, my knuckles actually get in. I can see just over my knuckles when I'm actually turning. And then when I come flat, obviously with this wheel in particular, I can see everything fine. So yeah, that came together quite well. Initial reaction here, once I went ahead and cinched everything down, everything is torqued down tightly now. And initial feeling on this is pretty good. But again, I do not expect it to be as good as like a, a one of the heavier duty cockpits that we can get that have like 160 profiles down here and, you know, side brackets bolting this piece of profile down to our base profiles, things like that. It's not going to be as stiff as those, but initial feeling is not that bad. I don't know what you guys can see. I'm pushing back and forth because that's how I drive. I push when I drive, don't pull. And when I do that, usually that's when we'll see some flex induced in the mounting system. But from sitting here and just initially turning it, which obviously is not a real test, it feels pretty good. But once we have it running on the track and we have 15 newton meters of torque on it, maybe it'll be a different story then. <laughs> so yeah, when we come back, we're going to get our pedal sorted. The pedal tray on the ASR1 cockpit is really cut out for and pre-drilled for things like this, the Logitech pedal set, which will fit on here. It'll fit in this slot and this hole back here, which is 187 millimeters. And it also fits across as far as the width goes. So you can put these right on here and employ five of the bolts. There's six holes in this thing. You can see that on the bottom here. So we'd have three across the front and two on the back. And that obviously should be very secure for a Logitech set of pedals or it's cut out for the Thrustmasters if you want to use those or like a Fanatec, the V3s and their CSL pedal sets will all fit on this plate. That's what it was originally cut out for. But it's a very heavy duty plate. It's over 16 pounds or 7.3 kilos. It's very thick plate, quarter inch, like, you know, 6.7 mil. So I think it deserves a better test than that. <laughs> so I want to put something on there that I can put some pressure on the pedals and I have several different sets I can choose from but the ones that will only fit are this R7 pedal set from SimGrade which is a very heavy duty stainless steel pedal set I did a review on these you guys can go check that out if you want they're the only ones that where the flanges on these the centers on the flanges will fit in any two of these slots so I can bolt them right to these slots like this. How well that's showing up on the camera. It uses, these are six millimeter or M6 holes. Yeah, got plenty of room there to put a nut on the bottom on each one of these. And the width will fit these slots. Doesn't give me a lot of maneuvering room here, but it'll do. Because I really don't need a lot. I can get that close on the throttle. I can bring the brake in. Get that close. The 
between the throttle and the brake, which should be okay if I ever want to do any heel and toe on this or something like that. But this is going to give us a heavy brake pedal. It's load cell based, pretty stiff, and see how this plate handles real pressure. It's such a heavy duty plate, I just couldn't resist it. <laughs> it's just a shame to test it with something like Thrustmaster, Logitech, or you know any of the Fanatec pedal sets. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to get this pedal set bolted on, and we come back. We'll take a look at it and see how it went. Now I have the R7 pedals securely mounted to our ASR1 heavy-duty pedal plate. Everything lined up well again. This is the only set of pedals that have a heavy-duty load cell, and I can put a lot of pressure on the plate with that would fit into these grooves without me drilling any holes. So I didn't think I would need to go through all that just to show you guys a heavy-duty set of pedals on here. <laughs> so the throttle... Again, everything, it feels pretty good. I've already been sitting in it and pushing on them clutch. As you can see, everything is working quite well. I can put some good pressure. Well, I need my, my leg really to put good pressure on the pedal for the brake. And that's one of the reasons why I employed this brake pedal, because I had to put a lot of force on this to make it work. A 200 kilogram load cell, 120 kilogram max uh, pedal pressure on it. So yeah, we're going to be seeing just how good this plate is when we're using it in the heat of battle. So there it is, the pedals are now securely mounted to our pedal tray, and we can move on to the next segment. Now we're ready to mount a shifter to the cockpit. Now I did run into a bit of an issue here because of the seat that I'm running. Now remember the space in between this cockpit's width, in between the outer rails here is 19 inches, or about 480 some millimeters. So this seat is kind of wide, and the reason I'm having a problem is because the side bolster, especially on this seat, kind of really comes out more than it goes straight up. So it's causing me a problem right in this area. If I raise it up, it's going to bump into this. Of course, not every seat's going to have a problem like this. But the good news is we have enough adjustability in this shift mount to overcome that and still get a sequential shifter mounted. I'm going to be using this one, and this is an SG sequential shifter, and it uh, has a flange on it where it has, we can put two M8 bolts in the flanges, and they give us enough hardware with the shifter kit. I've got a couple more of these M8 T-nuts, and I'm just going to pop these in the channel like that, put one there. And I'll put one over here. Like that. Easy enough. I'm going to put the shifter this way, because that's the less, as far as the space it takes up in the width, this bolt here. You know, I, nothing I can do about this nut on the pivot point. So there is a larger protrusion on this side than there is on this side. So I'm going to use this side and put it in this way, which means I'm going to have to loop the wire around back the other way. No big deal, but just showing you what's going on here. And this will allow me to put the shifter right in here up against the seat and still have access to my T-nut so I can get my M8 bolts in there. So that's how I'm going to mount this thing. So when I come back, I'll have it mounted securely and I'll have it pushed up as far forward as I can get it so that I can use it without having any interference of this back bar. And that's another thing to consider here. If you have long arms, you may, when you're grabbing this, even though we're coming out at an angle to grab the shifter, there is a chance of your elbow hitting this thing. And if you're going to be using this shifter all the time, it was your main shifter, you could always either cut this piece down, make it shorter, or you could just get another piece that is shorter, however you want to do it. But yeah, when we come back, we'll see how all this went. So I've got the shifter mounted and it ended up being in a whole different location than I thought it would which is a good thing because if it was back here yeah this would definitely be in my way but now I can reach out and grab this full size sequential shifter and shift it without hitting this while I'm doing it so I can just reach over here and my elbow will lean up against this back profile but it's not really hitting it when I'm going out to grab the shifter so I should be good to go it feels very solid it's a full size control and that's what I wanted to mount on here I can put it as much stress as I can to test this 
And of course, again, with the full size pedals, yeah, the brake pedal is going to put a lot of pressure on this plate and there's going to be some flex in this, no doubt about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress going on here when I'm pushing as hard as I can on this pedal. So we have to manage our expectations though, I think here, because this is a cockpit primarily made of 15 by 15 series profiles. And we do have some 1530s, but only for the uprights and for the shifter part of the shifter mount. And yeah, so again, we're managing our expectations, entry level cockpit, but we're going to put a lot of pressure on it just to see how it responds to it. And that should give us a better idea on if we were hanging like Thrustmaster or Fanatec CSL stuff on here, how that would perform too, based against what we're really putting a torture test on it. <laughs> so yeah, sequential shifters ready to go. Everything is done now as far as setting this up, as far as getting everything, all the peripherals set up where I want them to be. I'm ready to drive in this position. Just need to get my monitors pulled over here and get everything situated so I can actually start driving this thing. And when I come back, that's what we'll be doing. We're at Sebring and iRacing, and we are in the Corvette C6R GT car. Do a little driving here, put some pressure on this cockpit. Now the ergonomics of the cockpit are acceptable. I think that most people could get comfortable in this. I typically like to have my pedals higher. And if I was going to use this every day, I would build some kind of a platform on this pedal tray. I would lay it flat, build a platform up that I could put the pedals on top of maybe two to three inches. And this to get my heels in line with the plane where my bottom is sitting. It's more comfortable driving that, that position at least to me, I mean, everybody's a little different, but I would definitely do that. And I think overall it's done a pretty good job. I don't have the seat all the way back and I did have to move. You can see the pedal tray has moved in about, I'd say six inches or so. So I think and me being five, eight, I think somebody six foot wouldn't have any problems in this cockpit as far as length, depending on again, this, how big they are. So ergonomics acceptable for an entry level cockpit. I think it does quite well. But yeah, it can be tuned a little better and I would add some things to it to get it there. Now, if you've been looking at the shifter, it's doing a pretty good job here, actually. The shifter bracket is, I'm smacking it pretty good, especially on the downshifts. And I'm doing it on purpose to see if I can see in a video any kind of movement in that shifting platform there or the way that they have this set up. Now the shifter is, it's about as far as far as I can get it. So it's very close to the junction of where we're bolting these 1530 series together, the wheelbase upright and the shifter part of it. So the, I'm not putting a lot of, or I don't have a lot of leverage effect on the actual bracket system at this point. If the shifter was further back, I would have more leverage. We might see something then, maybe some lateral movement when I'm really slamming on it. But in this configuration, it's doing a great job as you can see. It's, I don't see any movement at all. You can watch the video and see if you've seen any, but I just never saw any. Now, the wheelbase. Okay, so now I'm looking at how this thing is going to handle the pressure of this 15 Newton meter wheel. This particular wheel is a Simucube Sport, and it maxes out at 15 Newton meters. I have this maxed out at 100%, so I'm putting some pressure on it again, trying to see in the video if I can get some movement out of it. And there is some movement. If you watch this long enough, you will see some forward and backward movement because when I'm pushing on the wheel or turning the wheel, I'm pushing on the wheel. I don't pull on the wheel. I actually push with my shoulder and my side of my body and yeah, so I can get a lot of pressure on it. That's typically where you'll see it move. I think right there it moved a little bit as I was going back and forth real quick in that pushing motion. But considering what we're using on this wheelbase upright, I think it's doing an acceptable job. It's not doing anything extraordinary, but yeah, it's, it's doing an acceptable job. It shows me that if you put a lesser wheel on here, you'll have no movement at all, probably. But when you start getting through these wheels, it, you're going to see a little bit. I really couldn't, it really didn't translate to me feeling it because it felt pretty secure when I was using it. So I can't really call it out for being a soft or a flexi wheelbase mount. But yeah, there is some movement there. And again, I like to show you guys everything I can. The pedals themselves under heavy braking, there is a little bit of flex in that pedal tray, even though it's a huge pedal tray, you know, it, it weighs 16 or over 16 pounds, but there is under hard braking with this full size pedal set, by the way, this is a heavy pedal set. 
And I did that on purpose too, because I want to see if there's any flex in there. But there is a little, if you see other heavy braking while you're watching this video, even the, the first portion when I was at Sebring, on the heavy braking zones, yeah, there is a little bit of flex, but not much. And I think it's quite acceptable, especially for an entry level type of cockpit that this is. So I think overall, ASR has done a good job with their ASR1 cockpit here. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and get to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the ASR1 cockpit from the guys at Advanced Sim Racing. This is part two of a two-part video review series I did on this cockpit. This one is called The Setup. Be sure to check out the build video or part one. This is what I would call an entry-level cockpit. The first part to go in my ASR1 was my seat. It mounted to the 15 series profiles that serve as seat rails with no dramas. Once the seat was secured, I moved on to mounting a servo motor to the optional front mount wheelbase mount, a half inch or a 13 millimeter thick piece of aluminum plate. Again, no issues encountered here. The included fixing bolts were plenty long enough to get the job done. I did add some angle to the mount to get my wheel to the desired position. Next, I mounted a top tier heavy pedal set to put as much pressure on the ASR1's pedal tray assembly that I could. The brake on the R7 pedal set has a maximum pedal pressure of 120 kilograms. The final control I mounted was a sequential shifter. I was able to find an acceptable position even though the seat I am using is on the wide side. As far as the ergonomics go, I found a relatively comfortable driving position via the available range of adjustments on this cockpit. Still, I would find a way to raise the pedal set's height to get it where I would want it. In testing sessions with the ASR1, it did meet my expectations considering its price point, with the pedal tray exceeding those expectations a bit. It did flex under the maximum pressure I was able to deliver with this stiff brake pedal, but not much and was not very noticeable when you were driving. The wheelbase did a good job handling all 15 newton meters of the SimuCube Sport wheelbase has to offer. There was movement, but not an extreme amount. The shifter mount was rock solid on the video footage with the full size control I was using. Overall, I feel like this is a well thought out design that uses the right components in the right places to deliver a relatively firm cockpit experience. It does not perform like top tier profile cockpits, but at $400 plus shipping, I don't think most would expect it to. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.